Hey, it's Jordan with the Young Turks, TYT Politics. I'm here with Travis Nichols. You're the spokesperson, media director uh, for Greenpeace, which, uh, in addition to Standing Rock, has done great activism work uh, around the country. I wanted to talk to you guys uh, directly. Obviously, a lawsuit, I've made my opinion known uh, that people could watch on the channel, uh, has been filed against you. It's not the first time Greenpeace has been under attack. Uh, among other things, Dakota Access Pipeline's parent company, Energy Transfer Partner, accuses you of basically milking donors, uh, kind of being this evil cabal that inspired violence and turbulence, and essentially Greenpeace and other environmental activists were, quote, eco-terrorists uh, that were pulling the strings of other eco-terrorists at Standing Rock. Uh, what, what's your initial uh, response to the lawsuit filed? Uh, well, I mean, it's meritless. It's, it, it's sort of a, it's an amazing document in a certain way to read through it and to see um, the links that they will go to to try to silence public advocacy, which is clearly what they're doing. Uh, it, it, it's not something that I feel like they even care about the, the end legal result. They're trying to initiate a process that will tie us up and will silence us and also will will show uh, other organizations that would want to speak out on this uh, particular um, issue about Standing Rock or about Dakota Access, but also just about any any other thing that's against this particular corporate agenda, mm -hmm. that they should be afraid, that this is the type of thing that um, in Trump's America could get initiated against you. And um, it's an abuse of the legal system. And so it's something where they're using legitimate, um, you know, something that has been used appropriately before they're using it in order to try and, uh, you know, advance their corporate agenda and to see what they can get away with. Frankly, I think one of the things that they're trying to do is to see, to test the limits. So like if they can go after this particular kind of public advocacy, then they could go after journalists, uh, next, they could go after some, you know, the ACLU next or something else like that. And so, it's incredibly disturbing. Obviously, re reading through it and seeing the implications of it, um, it's a it's a disturbing act. But then it's also something that you can see that oh, this is a pattern. This is a tactic that they're trying out uh, mm -hmm. to see what they can get away with. So I've read not all of it because it's a lot. It's two, over two hundred pages, but I've read most right. of it. Uh, I wanted to read one part that I thought was just frankly batshit crazy. Uh, it says Greenpeace's most senior leaders have admitted that their goal is not to present accurate facts, but to, quote, emotionalize issues and thereby, quote, pressure their donor audiences into parting with their money. When caught red when caught red handed spreading patently false misinformation, Greenpeace has conceded that to, quote, emotionalize targeted donors and other victims, it uses what is called what it calls internally alarmist Armageddonist factoids. Uh, first of all. I missed the press release where you admitted to milking donors and all that. Uh, I'm also assuming that you don't talk about Armageddonist uh, factoids, you know, at the coffee maker. Uh, can you can you respond to the most absurd uh, things? Yeah, I mean, that there's like I say, so many absurd things in there. And you, you get the sense that there's somebody at the at the at Trump's go-to law firm here who's got a sort of Homeland-esque chart up and they're trying to, you know, put this line connected with this line and this photo with this photo. Uh, one of the things that is so remarkable about this uh, lawsuit is how conspiratorial it is and how uh, kind of deep into, uh, you know, pick your Trump era villain, like deep into that conspiracy mind that they're going. Um, and the idea that it's uh, emotional, I mean, you saw with Standing Rock, you saw uh, groups of people, you saw indigenous groups, you saw ranchers, you saw, you know, so many different people come together to try to stop this pipeline and to stop something that was, you know, known to be environmentally destructive, that groups called out for being environmentally racist. You saw people come together to fight this, and and, the, and they won. And so the idea that it's emotional and that's somehow you know part of uh, their charge against it is it gives you a sense, it gives you a little window into their their mindset. Um, but the 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 idea then so after that you know victory in the fall or after there was it's the 
you know, Standing Rock looked like it had uh, really turned the corner and that had been a landmark moment. Uh, and then the election happened. And one of the first things that Trump said is, you know, he's going to restart it. it. You can tell then how inspired and invigorated Energy Transfer Partners is. And you can tell that other corporations are thinking, ah, so a lot of these things that we felt like maybe we had uh, had to put on the back burner, we now can put on the front burner. And not only that, but we can be even more aggressive in trying to roll back any kind of gains that um, the environmental movement and even you know progressive groups around the country have, have gotten in the past eight years that were honestly just a start. I mean, that's part of the whole thing is that it wasn't I don't think anybody felt like any of this work was done, but we felt like a lot of it was being um, moved forward. And so you can really see how, how shook they are, for one, and, and the links that they'll go to to try and stop it. Well, I, I want to bring that up. You mentioned Trump's attorney, uh, Mark Kasowitz, is one of the lawyers behind this. Uh, Trump, obviously, we know, uh, is all about these pipelines. He actually... Uh, has been trying to like woo Poland into selling natural gas to Poland. I don't know in a way if he's trying to compete with Russia in natural gas, who knows. But um, what is your thoughts that there's technically it's in the same orbit as the president? I don't think he has anything directly to do with it, but do you think this is all uh, kind of, tr uh, in a way, Trump's uh, personal attorney being part of this is a sign of things to come? Uh, I think that's a good analysis of it. I think it's a really good question to know, uh, to ask what, what are the connections. We know that the Trump administration will bend over backwards for the fossil fuel industry. We see it every day. You see different examples of it. Um, basically, any environmental issue, especially if it's an environmental issue that Obama had anything to do with, that the, their main priority is rolling that back. And so uh, that this is... Um, Kasowitz Benson. This is a law firm that Trump has gone to over and over again. It's one that he clearly is confident will uh, get um, the process started that he likes to initiate, which is, again, to silence and slow down uh, any uh, anyone speaking out against the corporate interests that he's invested in. As you say, he's made it clear that he's invested in this. These are things that he wants done. Um, but separate from that, this is his administration's agenda, clearly. This is the idea that energy transfer partners would get to go forward without any public criticism, without anyone speaking out. The idea that any other pipeline would be able to go forward um, without anyone speaking out, without anyone speaking up on behalf of the communities. Or even, you know, part of the deal is that these North Dakota communities and these indigenous communities there, we saw what they were doing. Part of the deal is that, you know, we saw this is happening. We want to support this in any way we can. So the story doesn't start with Greenpeace in any way. Greenpeace saw what was going on. We tried to help in the best way we can. And so you can see that they're uh, in this lawsuit. They're trying to um, they're engaging in a certain kind of public relations. I guess I'll say that, that they're, they're trying to maneuver uh, groups within the environmental movement. Um, to react in a certain way and to act in a certain way. And so it's a, it's a sophisticated move. I'll give them that. I mean, it's something that it is, um, there's a lot of money behind it. There's, uh, you know, I'm sure the best minds in the uh, nasty PR business are engaged in trying to figure out how to make this uh, maximally effective. Um, but luckily, on our side, um, not just Greenpeace's side, but on the, on the environmental movement side, we have, we have people and we have a lot of passion. So I'm sure once this um, case goes forward, a uh, reasonable court would see it as meritless. And also just the more people hear about it, uh, the more people will see how egregious it is. Um, and, you know, really what a sort of uh, astonishing echo chamber they must be in to think this could work. Right. Well, I also wanted to ask you, because since corporate media doesn't report facts and they only really went down to Standing Rock, when there was a chance there'd be like a wild, wild west shootout between veterans and the police. Um, it, it, their lawsuit is very brazen because it really, if you want to borrow from Kellyanne Conway, pushes forward alternative facts. So, for example, they're saying Greenpeace was, you know, sowing misinformation and discord and this and that. Yet The Intercept had this great story that we now know they were literally sending 
infiltrators in to sow discord and to, uh, you know, stir emotions or, or do all those things. We know that uh, they themselves were hoping uh, for some violent altercations to make uh, the water protectors look like, you know, they were, quote, eco-terrorists. So it seems like the things they're all alleging, it's already been reported by places like The Intercept that they were actually the perpetrators of a lot of the things that they're accusing uh, Greenpeace and other environmental groups of. They absolutely want to muddy the waters. I think that, um, you know, obviously alternative facts, fake news, fake law in this case. I mean, the, the idea that they're, um, they want to have people enter into this conspiratorial mindset in which they just can't be sure, people can't be sure of what they see. The images coming out of Standing Rock were emotional. They were um, bracing. I mean, they're heartbreaking in so many ways. And so to make it so people can feel like maybe I'm not get, maybe I shouldn't trust my reaction to those uh, images or those stories coming out of Standing Rock and coming out of other, other fights that maybe there's something nefarious going on in this, you know, I guess, I don't know what, what exactly you would call it, but some sort of deep conspiracy. Well, um, that serves their purpose and it serves their overall narrative of trying to make it seem like the victims are these corporate powers instead of the communities who are affected by this work. Um, and again, like I say, it's a very sophisticated thing and it's hard not to, uh, to want to get down in the dirt with them, um, with some of, as you're reading the, the allegations made. Um, but it's worth taking a step back and, and understanding the larger machinations of what they're doing, which are really disturbing. I mean, it, it, it is something they're trying to sow disinformation. It's, it's part of a larger propaganda, um, machine. And it's something that's really, really dangerous for public advocacy that, that doesn't, even if you disagree with Greenpeace, uh, looking at what they're trying to do should, should disturb you. And uh, lastly, obviously, part of this is intimidation. They know that there's going to be, there already is, uh, act activist demonstrations against, you know, Keystone 2.0 and Rover Pipeline and Transpecos, and the, the list is too long. Um, what, what would be your message? I, I don't know uh, if Greenpeace uh, in totality has a message, but to uh, environmental activists, indigenous people uh, who might look at this and maybe think twice about going down to, you know, these kinds of things, because we did see in Standing Rock people falsely arrested. I know a lot of people that had their lives thrown up inside, you know, lost their jobs, lost their homes because they couldn't leave North Dakota uh, because of false charges. So do you, sure. do you have a message to people who, who want to be active uh, looking at this lawsuit? Well, I, the same thing we would always say and what we were, you know, I think what we've tried to do in these cases, um, you know, with with an open heart, which is just, we've, we've been trying to help. I mean, this is, this is the situation is that there are people who've taken on such enormous risks like you've laid out and people who've risked their, their livelihoods and their homes to speak out against something that they find so unjust and egregious. And Greenpeace ha didn't begin the Standing Rock battle. Wasn't, it was something that we saw that was happening. We wanted to help and we stood with our allies and we stand with them still. And, you know, I think that there, one thing that this lawsuit will show, and we'll see what happens. But when people rally around it, and when people stand up and say this isn't right, and it's not just standing with Greenpeace, it's standing with the environmental movement and progressive um, advocacy organizations across the country and really around the world, because this is also, you know, Greenpeace International um, as well. That there's a lot of people who have your back. That this is something that um, clearly they have the money, but we have the passion. And we also have this side of history um, with us. So it, it's something where iconic infrastructure like this, it's the right thing to do to try and uh, argue against it in whatever ways that we can. And so when we see these different pipelines popping up, we see all these offshore things popping up, we know that the science says that the worst effects of climate change can't be mitigated without, without um stopping this infrastructure through governmental process, through public advocacy, through protest. Uh, this is how it's going to work. This is how we're going to stop climate change. So, you know, there isn't one succinct message for everybody who's working on this because it's such a wide-ranging problem. And as obviously you know, and 
sure everybody else knows it, you know, climate change is one of these things. It's a force magnifier. So every problem we have is only going to get worse uh, the longer we delay fighting climate change and trying to, you know, put forward clean energy rather than the this dirty energy infrastructure. So it, it's just to say that it's obviously a long, hard road. It's obviously something that they're going to throw everything at everyone who is working against these things and working for a better future. But I hope that this becomes a point that we can see this is beyond the pale. I mean, everything that they've done is beyond the pale, I feel like, but this is really something that's egregious. And I think people will come together and say, you know, we're, we're going to stand with these groups and we're going to continue to, to fight against uh, energy transfer partners and, and other corporations who are trying to you know, put profits over people. And I lied one more. To me, oh, yeah, sure. to me uh, this is beyond just climate change and the environmental movement because essentially what you have is Intercept, again, the great reporting that shows the federal government working with a Blackwater-type group was essentially coordinating to rough up people exercising the First Amendment, which is a definition of fascism uh, in, from everything I know about it. So to me, it's kind of bigger picture, what kind of country do we live in if the big oil company that, whether it's oil company or maybe Walmart is next, who knows, uh, can then essentially make the people they brutalize fit, you know, foot the bill. Um, what are your yeah. thoughts on the bigger ramifications beyond just the environmental movement? I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think that it, it's a great, it's a great frame. It's a great question to ask, like, what does this mean uh, beyond envir the environmental movement? I do. I think that this is well beyond Greenpeace. I think it's the, the chill that you feel is intentional. You know, I think that that's the idea. You're supposed to see this and you're supposed to say at least three hundred million dollars. I don't have three hundred million dollars. You don't have three hundred million dollars that I know of. Um, it's a shocking number, and it's supposed to be shocking. And it's also supposed to be something like I say. You're supposed to be confused. You're supposed to have the the 187 pages of meritless nonsense that's supposed to throw you off your onto your back foot. And what you're saying, you know, with um, the full range of um, nefarious operations are obviously being thrown at um, people that call into question uh, corporate interests and the corporate collusion with government or government collusion with corporations. And so that is beyond climate change. Uh, this just happens to be the one that they're, they're aggressively trying this tactic with. So it's shocking. I think it's sad. I think that every day there's something that my jaw drops to think this is the country that I live in. And I feel like I'm not under any illusions about that. It's just not the country that I want to live in. I know we've had our past, we've had our present, the future that I want, and I think that Greenpeace wants is vastly different than what we're seeing right now. So that's what we're working on. And, you know, it's, it's great to hear you uh, speak out about the, just the larger implications of it, because I, I, I agree and I find it very disturbing. Thanks, Travis. I appreciate it. And uh, obviously, I'll update everybody as, as this goes forward. Cool. Thanks a lot, Jordan. All right. Bye.